The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we, don't we see still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. So hello to anyone that's watching on the Twitch VOD, because obviously there won't be anyone else watching. Um, I'm here with Ben, Ben Burgess, uh, Ben Berger, as he's called by some. Um, and we're going to be talking about teaching and learning philosophy online. This this started because, Ben, you talk about kind of um, these new atheist people. Hitchens? Hitchens, yeah. It's where I got started with philosophy. It's where the first place I became interested in philosophy. Though, in a very personally kind of... So I was like a real Catholic Though obviously I'm talking about being like 12 or something here. Um, obviously from a Catholic family. I wasn't like uh, one of these internet people. I hadn't converted at 12 years old. <laughs> you, did, you, did, you did just sort of fall into it through the dime square sin. No, I, I wasn't a trad Catholic when I was 12. Um, and I read like one line. Do you know Darren Brown? Uh, Riggs a bell, I could tell you. He's like an English magician, but he also does like uh, debunking of magic. Okay, and so yep. he's part of kind of this whole new atheist kind of wave in the mid two thousands. There was like just like a paragraph in this book where he basically pointed out there was, you know, there was not really any strong and definitive evidence for God. And I was like, damn, wow, okay then. And then just became an atheist on the spot. But obviously, you are a you are a philosophy professor, right? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I'm an adjunct philosophy professor. It's not most of what I do at this point, but it is some of it. Yeah. It's, it's definitely not most of the money, I imagine. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get interested at first? I guess before the internet, really. I don't know how uh, old are you? I'm 42. Okay. Yeah, um, Yeah. semi before the internet. I mean, there, there was, uh, like... Um, there was like a primitive version of one, you know, when uh, when I was uh, <laughs> I was growing up, but uh, uh, yeah. So, but it was certainly before the new atheist and all of that, right? So yeah, that yeah. was um, uh, I had you know I dropped out of college for like I transferred a couple times and I dropped out for a year I worked at a kosher grocery store for a while the Panera for a I, while I was gonna I was gonna ask you what you started your major in but with the US you can just you can be a year in so I know right yeah you could be a year in and, uh, and not know that's right yeah um so yeah and I I had uh I think I actually did have a couple of different declared majors at one point or another but like I have a um but when I, um, I mean, I ultimately ended up being a double major in history and philosophy, and the history was mostly just kind of tacked on because I'd taken a bunch of classes in it, and I always found it really interesting. But, um, but yeah, it was like, um, I guess thinking back to this, so yeah, I, I you know, I started out at Lansing Community College and uh, in my hometown, Michigan. Because obviously, the thing with philosophy is it's not yeah. something that your like parents are going to push you to do, right? No, no definitely it's, not. No. Everyone that does philosophy has to have a story of how they became interested in philosophy because it's not going to become like happen naturally, right? You're not going to be pushed <laughs> into it or forced to do it, right? No, definitely not. And, and at least in the U.S. and probably in Britain, also, it's um, it's also different from a lot of other subjects in that, like you know, you could start out. You know, it's like, okay, so your parents are probably aren't going to push you to be a literature major either, but you can at least start out doing that because, like, you always loved your English classes growing up, you know. But, yeah, exactly. um, but there's no, um, but, you know, certainly in the U.S. system, um, there's, there's no, you know, you don't typically, like, unless you go to some weird private school, you know, you don't take philosophy K-12, right? So you, you, yeah. you're. I, you're first, I, I, yeah. I did take philosophy at 16, but that was because I went to a Catholic school. And then it mm. was just. 
It was taught by the people who taught the religious education thing, which in yeah. Catholic schools are people who would become priests, but unfortunately they're women. Right, 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 right. So right. Ser- serious <laughs> Catholics, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, right. So you have an advantage over me there, right? I mean, I never got to uh, to do that. Um, uh, although I do vaguely remember when I was sixteen or seventeen or so taking one of these like weird like multiple choice. Um, God, I'm trying to think what this is called, but like there's this thing that they'll they'll sometimes give like high school students to like decide. Oh, right, the thing a... the thing where it's like yeah, like answer this hundred question survey and it'll come out with what your job is. Yeah, 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 and it uh, and, and it actually did say philosophy theology, but uh, the uh, really it actually did. Yeah, that's true. It didn't just uh, say like give up on all hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it probably should have, but it didn't. Uh, but yeah, I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't actually take any. So in my case, it was maybe particularly weird because um, I didn't exactly take any philosophy classes until I decided to come back and major in it. Right, so I I had. Um, you know, so I had, I mean, I should also say, like, I barely graduated from high school. I was, like, enjoyed the uh, skipping class and getting high parts of life way too much to, you know, to study. And so, you know, heads the local. People assume for whatever reason I was, like, a good student, but it's not true at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I was a terrible student in high school, so I... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was like right on the edge of not graduating on time, but I did, and um, and so then like local community college, and then I transferred the first time, and then I dropped out and took a you know took a year off, and I'd taken like I said, I'd taken some history classes, I'd taken some religious studies classes, I hadn't exactly taken any philosophy classes, but I was just reading a lot during the year off, and. Um, I was reading, I remember in particular this book, it's edited by Walter Kaufman, it's called uh, Existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre, and I don't, I don't even know why I picked that up, but, you know, but I, I found... Um, I, th- I think this is a good kind of example of, of a life story, because I think this is probably the normal way that people yeah. have got interested in philosophy and engaged with philosophy before the internet, or before the internet became, like, a yeah. primary way for young people to express themselves. But obviously, I think yeah. the situation now... <laughs> your sort of stories are not really what happens, and so no. I don't know. So I don't no, know. I don't think. What, I, 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 yeah, my portrayal is very negative. I don't know if you're at all more positive, but my idea of how people become interested in yeah. philosophy online is that it's a pretty disastrous situation where it's going between people. People read Wikipedia, which is for philosophy really quite bad. Yeah. And also has a problem of kind of, there's no way to like, they don't judge, they don't say like, oh, this is an academic paper and this is kind of a conservative polemic, but it's just mm-hmm. like a source and they judge yeah, pretty right. much equally. So it's like yep. split 50-50, but the split should be 100-0, you know? Mm-hmm. And then the other thing is YouTube, which is split between kind of popular stuff, which is obviously surface level and invents like new words. Like we have a big problem on, well, not a big problem but there was a time after this big youtube video came out called optimistic nihilism which is a rip-off of some existentialist ideas especially Camus' absurdism loads yeah, I've, I've, actually, people... I've actually seen this video because a, a student asked me if I'd, I'd seen it and they sent me the link but yeah dozens of people made threads asking for more information on optimistic nihilism and we just had to tell them like fucking made up mate and like obviously it's taking ideas from here and you can look here but like you know the it, it, it just leads people down and like obviously by like associating with nihilism, it's like a real problem in the sense that kind of from Nietzsche and Sartre, you know, it's all kind of about rejecting nihilism while this is seen as kind of like an, an embracement of it. Um, and then the other thing is there's a lot of conservative polemics on YouTube, uh, which especially comf- if you want to like try and learn anything about kind of postmodernism or Foucault or something like that, the first results you're often going to see are right wing polemics yeah i mean i think that part of the reason that like somebody like jordan peterson is as um popular as he is i mean i i think it couldn't have happened if it wasn't the uh confluence of a few different things but i think one of them is just that like he you know he talks uh you know he talks about you know like philosophy a lot and uh and you know in 
this sort of weird combination of mystical babble and saying that postmodernism is bad and stuff like that. But like, whatever, I mean, it's, it's stuff that people are interested in. I think there's a lot of hunger for it. So I think that, uh, I think that alone is probably an underrated sort of, um, you know, cause of, of this, you know, this random person who like, you know, when you get right down to it, I mean, like he, he sounds very confident about what he's saying and it's like all strange enough to be interested, but like, is um you know but he also doesn't read anything right you know and and um and that's like almost literally right you know he doesn't, i mean it's, uh, this, it's this thing that kind of certain certainly in personality he's not kind of the right-wing alpha warrior right he's yeah. like an elite academic yeah, yeah. who has like a pill problem and sounds right. really weedy and like you know He's he's kind of like if Peterson fans were to make like a stereotypical leftist, they'd probably draw him more or less identically like Peterson. But obviously, and that's why I think it's the thing with Peterson. We'll get into it more later, but I think it shows. I, I, mean, I mean, it's it's sort of it's sort of encouraging, though, right? I mean, like if you're, yeah, yeah. you're watching this, if you're like a, you know, if you're like a middle aged academic with a pill problem and a strange voice, and you think that like you know you can't, there's no opening for you here, you know, like, you can you, you can make it. Yeah. You don't. You don't have to be a six foot four alpha to impress like the boys on the internet, right? Clearly, yeah. And yeah, I think the boys on the internet will be very easily impressed, and it's kind of it's an indictment of the left that there isn't kind of some kind of equivalent there. Obviously, there are kind of big mm-hmm. bread tubers who get mm-hmm. hundreds, thousands, or, or millions of views, but they're often focused on kind of cultural issues or kind of very directly on political issues so i'll do kind of political philosophy but kind of just directly on something like kind of in the news like i was searching around on, on bread tube for kind of a video on philosophy and the only one i could find with from like a significant channel was a very old video from philosophy tube and this mm-hmm. is something that's obviously if you made a video which pushed a certain angle on on, on free will you can get millions and millions of views but this just doesn't seem to be something that kind of leftist creators are interested in doing. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's true. I mean, I was thinking about that as you were saying that, and, um, and it is interesting because I actually don't know what the, um, uh, the person who does philosophy to, but I don't, I don't know what her background is pre YouTube. Right. But, um, N- Natalie Wynn is a is yeah. A, Natalie Natalie Wynn is a case of somebody who actually is like a philosophy grad school dropout. You know who, um, uh, although even there she she doesn't. Um, I mean, you're right. Like she she relatively rarely does talks about philosophy exactly. I mean, she sort of does around the edges, but um, that's that's very rarely any kind of focus of. Uh, uh, of what she's doing. I mean, it is most cultural analysis with like a little, a little dash of philosophy. Like there was, there's this big British, uh, apparently socialist YouTuber called Sean. Uh-huh. Um, but if you look on his channel, there's kind of one video about kind of material issues uh-huh. which is about railway nationalization. And then literally every other video is about cultural issues, which, you know, it's, it's not saying these things aren't worth, Sure, but it it is it is a it is a weird Fancy. gap, uh, for sure, right? Um, you know, it is actually interesting. I I think, um, yeah, I remember interviewing. So when I interviewed Natalie Wynn, I had I definitely made uh, some attempt to. Um, to like ask her about philosophy about like what her like thesis was going to be and stuff like that and you know you could tell that's that's really not what her uh, where where her head is at these days which is fine and probably, you know, and like, probably not what people ask her questions about no i'm sure it's not no. <laughs> so uh, yeah yeah no right that's that that is interesting i think i think you're right i think it's an under um uh like and i think in particular the sort of intersection of the two is is kind of uh underexploited area right like another like there's there are people who there are people who do um like philosophy uh philosophy content on youtube i'm thinking here of like uh alex uh something the cosmic skeptic that guy 
Uh, no, but the cos- cosmic skeptic is kind of, I think, one of the uh, unread philosophy is kind of the, one of the main sources of kind of bad people coming uh-huh. in with kind of like bad ideas and, and stuff. He's like very, very against compatibilism in, in free will, for instance, and seems it is. is uh, he is, yeah. In, in kind of one of the people who sees it is kind of inherent nonsense. Uh huh. That is, it's an interesting, someone, one of the main contributors on Reddit as philosophy said that kind of a good demonstration that someone's kind of graduated to a point where like they can reasonably engage in philosophy is a point yeah. in which they were willing to see compatibilism, even if they still think it's wrong, is something which isn't nonsensical yeah. or absurd. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. Uh, uh, yeah, I was thinking about that because that, that is interesting because I, I do think that, yeah, in sort of YouTube philosophy such as it is when people talk about free will, uh, there's this sort of, um, yeah, there's this kind of very simple free will skepticism that's sort of the overwhelming uh, position, which I think, you know, I think some of that might just be about the, uh, you know, the format. It's sort of very easy to present that in a, in a punchy you know, uh, and it's it's sort of well, um, it, it's it's a very appealing to do in the sense that like, you know people will naturally believe they have free will, right? And so if you can like knock out some big controversial, like saying people have free will yeah. outside of these online communities isn't controversially interesting. It's right. the default normal position that people have. Sure, yeah, of course. While saying people don't have free will, oh, yeah, right. It's it's interested. It's kind of edgy and excited. And it's very you know if, if you're not really up on um yeah i mean if you're not familiar with compatibilism or or are a little bit and just but just sort of think it's silly then that that you uh that it's it it's it sort of feels maybe it's in that sweet's like interested and edgy but it also seems it also feels like very easy and simple to argue for yeah 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 which which, which you know which for that matter is pretty is, is some of the appeal of atheism right i mean that the yeah, uh, yeah. those two things yeah yeah definitely and um, for, for the listeners who don't know, compatibilism is this thesis that determinism, the idea that if you always put in the same inputs, you always get the same outputs, is compatible with humans having freedom, as it's commonly understood. Um, and this is kind of seen as some as inherently absurd, because the idea is that free will is kind of something to do with, even the same circumstances, you might do different things. Uh, but compatibilism says this isn't necessary. Um, yeah, the, so it, an it, interesting thing... The, the the kind of free will that you need, you know, cause you know, I mean, I think, uh, I think you're more, uh, I think a pretty plausible early move you can make here is to say that they're, um, that this, this phrase free will is, is a little ambiguous, you know, that they have a, that like there are different kinds of, of control that people might have or lack over their actions. And, um, yeah, well, you know. one obstacle I think you have in explaining compatibilism is some people hear free will, they kind of inherently associate with something kind of like metaphysical or magical mm-hmm. or kind of beyond the bounds of kind of physics or whatever, like inherently just by yeah. itself. And then you kind of like, you explain to them like, but under compatibilism, you're free in all the usual ways that you understand that word. But they're like just being humanly free, that's not the same as free will. And you're like, well, why not? Yeah, right. Like, I, I think, I, I'm trying to remember, so I think Jerry Coyne, uh, who's, who's also definitely uh, belongs somewhere in the, in the um, pantheon of villains in the story, right? Because he's, <laughs> uh, um, he's like the perfect example of the, uh, of the scientist who, like, has opinions about philosophy, but, you know, but thinks it's, like, kind of a dumb waste of time to, like, read you know, to like read yeah, anything yeah. about it, you know, but, uh, uh, but I, I remember him posting this thing. He was like, I think the, the post was called like compatibilism, a metaphor. And it's this, um, and it was, I think it was from that Saturday material comic, you know, and it, it was somebody, um, being like, you know, Hey, I'm going to show you a dinosaur. Then they show you a bird. And it's like, oh, you know, that's not what I meant. Right. You know, like, uh, there's a little bit of that feeling to it, but yeah, yeah. But I think if you say, well, okay, care, right? Whether we whether we have free will, I mean, what's 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 the sort of larger context? What do you think is at stake? And maybe a couple things, but certainly one of the main ones is moral responsibility. And if um, and so I I think when you start thinking not like um, okay, I'm going to use this this kind of this this phrase that I might automatically associate with the sort of you know 
ghost in the machine ordering my body to do things that you know you know like that that violate causal uh, laws. But I'm um, they say okay, I'm specifically interested like what kind of free will, what kind of control over our actions do we need to be responsible for those actions? And then I think it starts to sound much more reasonable to to say that you know we don't need to tell this sort of you know, grand metaphysical story to explain what it is that we normally think is relevant or irrelevant to that. Yeah. One interesting thing that Natalie Wynn said I saw was that new atheism is obviously seen as kind of the cause or like the first yeah. ancestor of kind of online right wing kind of movements in terms mm-hmm. of kind of um, incels and this sort of thing. Like mm-hmm. the first time people became like orientated themselves on a community on the internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also she says, and it seems kind of correct to me that it not just, you know, you can take the blame and say it birthed these right wing things, but it also birthed a lot of left wing people. The first kind of, obviously she says this mm-hmm. is the case for her and it's the case for me also mm-hmm. the first place we got interested in philosophy. And obviously kind of, it's interesting because new atheism was kind of a big and significant thing because it was fighting against Mm-hmm. Um, like young earth creationism and this kind of thing, which is associated with these kind of very right wing movements. Um, and it was seen basically as fighting against American conservatism. And obviously kind of yep. things have shifted, the train has shifted since then. And you're kind of the same sort of people who love the new atheists will now love Jordan Peterson, who obviously is a guy that thinks that like <laughs> Nietzsche is basically giving like a friendly critique of Christianity. Yeah. 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 Uh, Right, like that's yeah. I actually have no idea. Uh, trying to distract by that last part because I have no idea what like Jordan Peterson's like reading of Nietzsche is because like somehow he's like super duper into him, but he's also like some kind of weird quasi Christian mystic. So I I, he, I don't thinks, fully understand that. He thinks that Nietzsche means that the death of God is a bad thing, right? And that there we go. it's not kind of an inevitable road and it's something that we can do to like, you know, unkill God a little bit. Okay. Okay. And gotcha. so that when he's talking about dragons or whatever, he's trying to like unkill God a little bit. All right. No, that's, that's good. That's a, that's a clear explanation. I like it. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, so, so new atheism, uh, I, I mean, I think what you're saying about, you know, you and Natalie Wynn, I think is really important because it's, it's my perception too, and I I think it's a lot of people on the left, um, at least in left media, don't seem to have that perception. They they seem to share the last part of your perception, right? That like, you know, the people who were once into new atheism are like into Jordan Peterson and stuff now, and there's definitely some truth to that. You know, like there there is there is a big chunk of people who are into new atheism. You know, who who got into. Um, you know, who are, for example, into Jordan Peterson and, and who have sort of like soft right wing kind of uh, culture war interests now, you know, like that they that in that sort of bar stool conservative kind of way where you're, um, you know, you're not necessarily even anti abortion, but you know, but you 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 have a lot of sort of, um, you know, you have a lot of like sort of knee jerk anti woke impulses that sometimes lead you in very stupid directions. Um, so well, this this has happened to you like the day like two days ago or yesterday or something where basically you admitted the truth that when you see people yes. acting in absurd ways on Twitter it's it's cringe and makes you like think that the left is cringe and you got a pretty furious reaction to that. Yeah, no, I I did. I mean, it was a sort of half joking tweet, but I also I I should I mean I I also did mean it. Right? You know, I was, I was yeah, yeah. sort of phrasing it in a half joking way, but like. Uh, but yeah, what I, I I screenshotted a a particularly cringed uh, Twitter interaction uh, and um, uh, and said uh, there was just kind of people sort of trying to like one up each other in this like strange way about um, whether like Native American folk beliefs counted as a form of science and yeah. um, and then I uh, I said look you know I'm still a leftist because I I care more about uh, you know healthcare and, you know, war and peace and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, than, you know, that I do about uh, people, you know, uh, you know, people posting cringe nonsense on Twitter. But, like, I do get how this stuff, you know, makes people, you know, drift. Viscerally, I get how pe- this stuff, you know, makes people drift to the right, you know. Yeah, which... I think that's a lot of, um, 
a lot of people kind of got into far right stuff, especially on YouTube, via cringe compilations. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And right? I mean, liberals, is, yeah. kind of liberals protesting, is one of the, kind of the main sources of cringe. I mean, you saw this is kind of like going from the protest. Yeah. Form interactive cringe into like a step of combining them, but you saw those people arguing in Seattle, right? Mm -hmm. Like outside their cars. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember They're this, having like yeah. a road rage incident, but the full thing was like coke cloaked in the language of social justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, well, you're a, you know, you you cut me off in traffic. Well, you're a settler colonialist, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah no, absolutely. Which is the, uh, I mean, I I feel I feel like. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know. This is incredibly subjective, but I mean, I feel like that sort of Twitter and in, in, in IRL Twitter interaction has is, is gotten a lot more common lately. Uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, but yeah, like, 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 lots of people, sort of, lots of people who were new atheists, you know, um, have, you know, not necessarily the far right exactly, although sometimes, yeah, yeah. but, uh, but they have. Um, but have have drifted right to you know to one degree or another you know kind of because of some of these dynamics we're talking about. But I also think that um, you know a lot of people miss the el like a really important element of what you said a minute ago, which is that like I I feel like there's a certain kind of story that uh, about new atheism that's did by you know I don't know I I, I guess I. I keep saying things like left media. Let me just say like friends of mine who are podcasters who I think get this slightly <laughs> wrong, right? You know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, uh, which, which is that like, they sort of read back that trajectory into original them and sort of say, cause they have to tell some story about it, whereby it was always right wing and bad that it was, um, that it was like primarily war motivated by like war on terror era Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. And I think that's importantly wrong, not because there was no war on terror era Islamophobia in the mix of new atheism. There absolutely was. Uh, but uh, I actually don't think that was the main sort of wellspring of new atheism. Yeah, I think I mean, main, if, when you read yeah. these, these books like by Harris or by Dawkins, yeah, like yeah. Islamists do come up sometimes, but the focus is very much like at home with, yeah homegrown kind of the christian right totally right i mean if if anything right the the is like if anything i think the islamists are almost there as like a sort of like as as just as as a way of jabbing at the christian right you know that the uh, like yeah like it's, it's to say that like well people still do this it's like well actually your sharia yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. sharia is when you have abortions or sharia is when you don't have abortions <laughs> i mean yeah. i don't know what yeah, I spoke to this about you. It's the same thing that people do with Ukraine, right? Yeah, like, totally. Ukraine's woke, or Ukraine's anti-woke, or it's like, it's just a different <laughs> thing. Like, there's more than, like, six things in the world. Yeah, uh, so so I know this is a person who, who, you know, people, some people are watching, have various complaints about, and, you know, and, and, and whatever you think about all this, but, like, uh, Jesse Singel had a good short essay the other day called The Rise of the Anti-Woke Weirdos, where he, um, yeah, I guess the title's kind of self-explanatory, but I mean, like, he, he sort of, the point is very simple, which is just that there are people who sort of have, um, maybe they get kind of canceled over nonsense, or maybe they did something a little bit wrong, but, you know, there was like a, there was an extreme reaction, and then um, they're getting all this hate from people they used to like, and all this love from, you know, like right-wing culture warriors and, you know, the inevitable happens yeah. and they, um, and because that becomes their like story for everything, right? Every goddamn thing that happens has to be explained in terms of this one stupid little prism, right? Yeah. You know, that's, so, so you end up having like, you end up having people, yeah, giving these bizarre explanations about like the, uh, that's like, well, in some way or another, the war in Ukraine, you know, like verifies whatever I think about wokeness on American, you know, campuses, uh, so yeah, I, I think that I think that, that I mean, this, this yeah. is why I got tired of kind of the anti woke left or whatever. Yeah, I was yeah. big into for like a while into like stupid poll and stuff like this. Yeah, but yeah. What I what I got tired with was wokeness was the focus on these certain issues. And what I hoped to find in kind of the anti woke left was a different politics. But what in fact I found was kind of the same politics but with a different view, a different perspective. Focus on the same issues with the same curiosity but just with a different view on them, which is not what I wanted at all. 
Yeah, I will say, um, you know, that the as as much as uh, you know, uh, this is obviously self serving, and I think that the um, that uh, you know, again, I know many people have you know have many sort of you know complaints that are unrelated and you know whatever, but like. I think uh, I gotta say I think uh, I think Jacobin, you know, does um, like is is a sort of prime prime example of um, of a place where you know everybody is at least you know sort of like you know quietly anti woke, you know, but they have a um, uh, but uh, but they. But you, you, if if you paid like a bot to try and like read all the Jacobin articles and come up with like a single political line, you wouldn't find anything at all. They'd find no correlation. Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I think that there are certain sort of minimal commitments that anybody who writes for Jacobin has. But I do, but I do think you know I I, I agree. You know you're gonna you know I mean you're gonna get some variation even on this question, right? You know, but I mean I th- I think at least. I don't know. At least all the Jacobin people I like. I meant not to contradict you at all. I meant to say that, yeah, they have kind of staff who are inclined this way, but they don't yeah. have them limit themselves at all because of it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, um, yeah. I mean like the, but like people, but like that seems like a place where people have like, you know, everybody sort of rolls your rolls their eyes at that stuff and you can kind of tell if you read enough of it that they would kind of roll their eyes at a lot of that stuff but it's absolutely not the focus of um of what people of what people write in fact it's like yeah. maybe even i think a little bit too absent you know from uh from yeah, what but they, it obviously know. and then when they do put out something which is inclined along uh, these lines because they've kind of acquired an audience which is incredibly broad range and includes very well people uh, get like a, a quite a furious reaction famously like with with connor's article yeah, yeah. Where he said like oh you can have kids like it's fucking fine don't worry about it and like <laughs> and then yeah, yeah they got yeah no, that the, the, he's like advocated the handmaid's tale or something yeah no. um yeah no I, I i think that's absolutely right which you know is is um i don't know but uh but yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on all that. I mean, I think the sort of like, I think the sort of bat, you know, I, I tend to think the kind of correct line that that stuff, like, you know, that's like one out of every seven things you say, you know, right. the, uh, and then the, uh, the other, the other six out of seven, you stick to talking about things that are objectively more important. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I think that, uh, but yeah, I think there is a similar dynamic with, uh, with, with new atheism, you know, that it's like, um, you know, it's like even the way that like some like sort of like Enlightenment era like writers in England would like say shit about Catholics. It's like they're not really <laughs> saying that because they they're like, you know, they they really spend their time thinking about Catholics. The Catholics are are there as a code for like the people who are too religious in England or whatever they're objected yeah, to, yeah. right? You know, they have a and um, but yeah, I think that I mean um, Harris's book was called A Letter to a Christian Nation. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, exactly, right. And it's, and I think that that's. I think you're exactly right about that. I think that the it was new atheism was very much a phenomenon of the liberal side of the culture war to, uh, to you know mid to late two thousands, you know Bush era and the sort of part of the Obama era that still felt like the Bush era, uh, and it's um, and it makes sense, right? It made sense like that you could have like that degree of cultural purchase then because. You know, I always think about like the, you know, I don't know, there's like a Family Guy episode where Brian meets one of his girlfriends because they're both reaching for the God delusion at Barnes and Noble at the same time. You know? <laughs> but, uh, like... yeah, that, that's why I was going to say the other notable thing to speak about with, with New Atheist, apart from the fact that we shouldn't see it as kind of like yeah. a purely right wing thing, is that it was successful at a time where philosophy, even in kind of a degenerate form that you'll find in like mm-hmm. Dawkins or whatever, did actually appear on stage at a point where it wasn't meant to. And people weren't mm. meant to read philosophy anymore, and it wasn't something that people were meant to care about anymore. Like, yeah. for instance, yeah. and kind of in the meantime, I think there hasn't been something more which has filled that gap. Like, we get complaints on Reddit as philosophy, being like, "Why are there no philosophers anymore? Uh, well, why is there no one doing public philosophy anymore?" And it's like, well, obviously there are, and there sure. are plenty of philosophers, and there's plenty of people. They're doing just not as philosophy. prominent as they were. Yeah. 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 No. Ab- absolutely. Right. Um, I mean, and I think that like that's that's kind of the thing about 
you know, because like there is a sort of aspect of the kind of standard left critique of new atheism that I I agree with, you know, that 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 I I talk about in the the Hitchens book that I think that like I think that um, I think that it is. Uh, I mean, I think that in some ways this is a kind of very like this. I you know, there's this often this idea that you sort of like fix the religion thing and then like you know downstream of it like your political problems have have gone away that i think is is just kind of misguided and i and i i think that there's a you know i think there's a way that that leads people to to into badly drawn friend enemy distinctions that um you know that i i I don't actually think that whether you're you know uh whether you um uh you know whether you have the right views about metaphysics is is going to very closely track you know your your uh, your political positions usually i mean there are certain there are certain forms of religiosity that obviously do lend themselves to uh, to reactionary politics you know but um but there's you know it's a lot messier more complicated than that i think that all that's true right but i think that it's it's also um but i don't yeah i, I still don't think it was an entirely bad thing and i think that there's a you know like and I think there are a lot of people certainly anecdotally there are a lot of people I know right you know who were who like might have grown up in like I don't know usually like evangelical kinds of households and you know who that was like that was huge for you know encountering that and, and get into um, you know sort of some some validation and like okay this stuff that didn't quite make sense to me you know like here's somebody who's expressing why not you know better than um, yeah, I mean, I think that definitely we don't have a problem right now where, like, the left is too focused on critiquing religion. I think yeah. that's, it's a critique <laughs> yeah. that's completely disappeared. And, like, it is something which is, like, the recent kind of Roe versus Wade thing, the fact that all these judges are Catholic is a really significant part of why this incredibly major American political event has happened, but yeah. it's just not really spoke about at all. It's kind of, like, it's talked about yeah. in purely secular terms, like as, you know, they're reactionary and, and, and right wing yeah. and whatever. But the fact that kind of it's a specific Catholic teaching, which directly yeah. led them to do this, is just kind of elided. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I think that's kind of true. Yeah. So I, I think, um, yeah, and I think that it's also just, look, this is something, uh, the fact that, the American right wing sort of wore Christianity on its sleeve in the way that it did in the 2000s is probably essential for understanding why new atheism was able to get that kind of cultural purchase. Uh, I have now it's yeah. Now those conditions aren't exactly there, even though uh, it's not like the evangelicals and the right wing Catholics have gone anywhere. Right. In fact, as you point out, they're, you know, they've just won one of their most significant victories ever, right? You know, that the, um, that, you know, something they've been trying to do for 50 years, uh, almost. Oh, and they're still an incredibly important, you know, there are fewer of them, that's true. But like, they're still, you know, like, it's still enough that there, there are, you know, they're still an incredibly important voting bloc for the Republican Party. And, you know, all of those things are, are true. You know, I think that uh, it's, um, you know, but nevertheless, it's not like it's not central to the branding of America, you know, of the most prominent American conservatives in the same way at all. I mean, like that the you know, I mean I, <laughs> I mean I can't imagine Trump like any genuine kind of I can't imagine him praying. No, no, I not only not only can I not imagine Trump praying, like the mind reels at the thought, uh I, I mean, I, I think he, um, I think he actually did at one point earlier in his life. Apparently, he did go to. Uh, he was like in in the church or something of that guy who wrote the uh, that you know how to win friends and influence people that thing. Oh, right. uh, but uh, I didn't know he had a church, but of course that makes sense in America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, right? Uh, and uh, but yeah, like not only can I not imagine Trump praying, but like I can sort of like. I don't know. I, obviously, this is an exaggeration, but like, I think there's some truth to it that, like, if I mean, Trump could like do a um, 
do a speech where in the background there was like an upside down crucifix that was dripping with you know dripping with like goat's blood yeah, and yeah. as long as he owned the limbs in the speech you know it's been totally fine oh, with people it, always you know? like, oh yeah it's saint peter's cross what are you talking about <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can always <laughs> interpret stuff just back the other way you know yeah i, I that's so it, it's not um yeah so so i mean yeah that that difference between bush and trump you know probably um probably says it all there but but i do think that it's also something that there's and actually i am going to be interested to see like now that there's this kind of uh you know if nothing else the roe v wade reversal um and you know some other thing you know and like some of the socially conservative things that republicans have done at a state level i i I do wonder if that's going to sort of bring the issue back to the fore a little bit but uh but even if it doesn't right like i think it's it's a that's like a, a that's just like a thing that human beings are always going to be interested in is the yeah. the, the religion atheism thing now I, I do you know my other critique of new atheism besides the one we earlier is then maybe is actually more central to this sort of overarching uh theme today is is just that like uh i wish those you know i, I wish those guys had known you know had like had uh, I wish those guys had been like a little bit more immersed in philosophy and more, made more sophisticated arguments, right? You know, like that. Yeah, because 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 that's the thing that obviously you read these books, but then if you then went and read like Patinga or whatever, like a yeah. big kind of Catholic philosopher, you'd be like, "Wow, this is a lot more sophisticated than that." And kind of what they're saying isn't kind of well, it's kind of a thing of like it's it's strange to think about it, but it's like they were attacking. You know, there's people write books now, which are basically complaining about Twitter. But in some sense, they were kind of just com- they were complaining and attacking complete, like, total pop arguments. It's like pop yeah, against yeah. pop, right? Like, it's the stuff that you'd hear your youth ministers say right. against their arguments, right? Yeah. Which, in some sense, is like, obviously, that's why they sold lots of copies. But you can right. do this kind of popular work, I think, and hopefully, while also being substantive in some way. Yeah, I hope so, right? I, I, I think so, right? I think and I think there is a way of of doing both, right? I mean that you can sort of say, like, look, here's what your youth minister might say and here's what's wrong with that. But while we're at it, here's this like you know, here's what this like much better version of your youth minister would say. And you're like, here's what's wrong with that, right? You yeah, know, yeah. like like I think that there I think there is a way of um you know, there is a way of, of doing that. At least I, you know, at least I hope so, right? I mean, because because as somebody who you know who does like um, who does like philosophy and and is interested, you know, among other things, you know, in in doing, you know, some kind of you know popular philosophy. I mean, my my optimistic assumption is that there is you know there is an audience for um, you know there is an audience for uh, for actually like. Uh, you know, for actually like explaining the complicated, interesting stuff. Yeah, I mean, and this is a perfect transition point because I wanted to talk in in the final third uh, of this about you. <laughs> okay. Um, you're trying to become. You've just said you're trying to become a, a popular philosopher, right? Or, or something along these lines. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've act, I have tried to. I mean, obviously, like ninety percent of what I do with my life right now is sort of just kind of direct like political commentary you know that there's uh uh but but i have you know i mean i've actually kind of tried in the last year or so especially and i, I always did a little bit before you know but like you know I've, I've even sort of like consciously thought about this since like so i've kind of tried to increase the percentage of what i do that's that's popular philosophy just kind of uh officially because like it's uh it's what i it, you know because because like i I find it interested and satisfied in a different way, and and like and, and I I I just uh, I think I think I'm happier, you know, if if there's a if there's a little bit more of a balance between those two things. I think 100 percent there's an audience there. I think if that if, if Peterson proved anything and, and Harris proved anything, man, I don't know. <laughs> sorry to go back a bit. Yeah. Have you seen what the the latest madness that kind of Harris is putting out? Uh, no, actually, I haven't seen any Harris a little bit. What's what's he's he doing? going really, really hard on the kind of there's no free will thing, and he like managed to convince a large number of his his followers that there's no way to know what your next thought is going to be. 
Okay, that's a really okay. Interesting, yeah. Which seems like that's just like kind of admitting you're like a bot, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> you don't have any forward thinking at all. But it's obviously this thing where people get very committed to these figures, and then you watch them have a have a conversation with someone with a with a panelist on on Reddit as philosophy, where they're like, of course I can know what my next thought is if I plan out my if I like think like my next thought is going to be about guitars. And I can just start thinking about guitars. And they're like, well, <laughs> and it's this thing of like, people become very committed in, to these figures. And then yeah. they'll come to somewhere like Red Ass Philosophy, willing to like hear minor corrections. Yeah. And we'll be like, this is total bollocks. And they're like, well, <laughs> you're, not, you're not playing fair, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, that's interesting. But I, mean, I guess this is a variation of the argument that Harris has used for a while. So he has. Um, I, I did a uh, episode of my podcast uh, with uh, with a few different guests on called uh, Sam Harris is wrong about everything, uh, which is a which is an overstatement. He's not wrong about everything, you know, but just yeah. a lot of things. Uh, and um, in the free will part of that, you know, we watched this this video where he says in his you know extremely calm, confident, guided meditation, you know, kind of voice uh, that. Uh, uh, like he asked people to um, to think of a city, and uh, and then say, okay, everybody's thought of a city, and then you know you can tell yourself some kind of you know, and why did you think that you know think of that city, and you know you can tell yourself some sort of like story about why it was, but you don't really know right why that particular city popped into your head, and uh, and he, he he makes this our move where he says well if anything's free will this should be it because it's just you and your thoughts you know there's this there's nothing you know nothing else there it's like well no right i mean this this isn't like like well, nobody, I do, I nobody do stuff. Thinks, yeah, yeah you're not trying to do anything right you know like like nobody's but like what nobody, is his point but and then what's the uh, but like the i did point, imagine the city yeah well the point is that you that <laughs> whatever it was that made that particular city pop into your head was outside of your control. Therefore we don't have free will. It's a bizarre inference. Okay, uh, okay. I get it. But okay. like, cause it's not, um, you know, cause, cause what's the, you know, cause like, even if you're thinking, I mean, and like, we don't have to go to some like analytic philosophy thing where people are arguing about compatibilism or whatever. I mean, like just, just in, in context, they're totally foreign to that. Right. When people are thinking about free will standardly, what are the kinds of examples that they're thinking of? Well, I mean, look, you can think about like, uh, like Star Trek has this, uh, you know, it is as existentialism is humanism essay. He has this famous example about the, uh, this, uh, young man who came to him during the war. who's uh, trying to figure out what to do because, uh, his, I think his brother was killed by the Nazis. And he really wants to go, you know, join the resistance or maybe the free French in Africa. I'm not sure. And, you know, and fight the Germans, uh, but he's the sole support of his mother, and he feels like mm-hmm. he needs to stay with her, and all this stuff. And he was really torn about what to do. And you know, Sartre has this whole, you know, all these sort of lessons about how you're, you know, existentially define yourself with your choices or whatever. But like, uh, but forget that part, right? Just like this is something that in this context that's totally foreign to those other sorts of arguments. Like this is the kind of example that people are thinking of when they're thinking about free will, and it's like this is not like, you know, what happens to drift up to the top of your head, right? This is where you have like yeah. reasons for and against courses of action, and you're and you're you're struggling with what to do, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing they're, you know, that people are actually thinking of, you know, when they're, um, you know, when they're thinking of, uh, of of free will. This just seems completely irrelevant. So you know, I, but like again, he's like it's it's. I mean, it's got this cute interactive example, right? You know, everybody's watching gets to play. He sounds, you know, he sounds like really silky and confident. Yeah, he's really it. good at what he does, obviously. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, ben, I think it's very yeah. interesting on this topic to talk w- with you because I think you're someone who deliberately is trying to avoid being pushed into kind of the subcultural left or something like that with mm-hmm. your content, with the people you're trying to reach. But also at the same time, and these may be causally linked, People get um, disproportionately frustrated with you uh-huh. online. <laughs> For instance, when you went on uh, the show of the minor neo-Nazi figure Joe Rogan and then platformed him, uh, yes. uh, and, I did and, platform and, Joe Rogan. That's true. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, do you, do you feel think the two are linked, or do you think? Uh... <laughs> yeah, um, sure. I mean, I I think that. I mean, look, it it could be, if nothing. I mean, look, leftists are often annoying, even to other, even or especially to other leftists, uh, and um, you know, there's. Uh, you know, people who are into a certain kind of, you know, analytic philosophy or, I don't know, not to me, but perhaps to some people somewhere annoying. Uh, so uh, that's, you know, there, there, could be a, there could be an intersection of a few different things here. I think it's also, I, I think that it's probably also true that, yeah, I mean, I think those are linked, that there's, that, um, that I think that figure people often get mad at figures like uh, me or like um, you know very different person with very different interests. But I think in terms of the way people get mad at him, like Freddie DeBoer, for example, mm. who uh, fall who are people who because I I think that the getting mad at worthy feature that people are are reacted to is if we agree with them right on on like 90 percent of of everything right you know yeah. that it's like that's like like you know just to sort of you know pick your political topic you know more or less agree about it you know that um, but then you have somebody who who has that 90 percent agreement but then they don't sort of fall into line completely and they and they try to avoid like the dumb shit that you do that alienates people and they um uh and and they um and they're well, i mean there's pick. this thing of kind so, of like yeah if you're speaking to leftists you'll want to use yeah. kind of like a specific specialist vocabulary yeah which will hit all kind of the right bases for them yeah. but this like this same language is kind of alienating or incomprehensible to other people and so oh, yeah. if you speak in a different way, you can end up saying basically the same things but using the wrong words. Right. And then you'll get a negative reaction from, from leftists. Yeah, I think so. And, and I think it's, it's also um, – yeah, I think, that, I think that's definitely a thing that happens. I also think that, um, like, yeah, I think that there's something about that combination of sameness and slight difference that uh, that, like – makes people really frustrated sometimes that they have uh that like maybe maybe much more so you know than you'd get with uh you know i mean it's not an original thought here you know but like you know with with uh you know with bigger differences and uh and so i think that's a i think that's a thing that happens i think that if they i i, I think that like sometimes like Okay, well, I mean, let's let like thinking about that Rogan conversation in particular, right? Like the first like hour of it, I mean, it's Joe Rogan; he does really long episodes, you know. So like the yeah. first the, the first like hour of it was like mostly spent on sort of you know bread and butter socialist things, you know, and then um, and and then there's a point afterwards where uh, you know where you know the subject started drifting around a lot, and like there's a there's a point where uh, where he's um, you know, he's asking me about the, uh, about like, uh, you know, trans women's participation and, you know, in, in, in women's sports, it sort of brings up Leah Thomas as an example. And, um, you know, I, I think I, I think the first thing I said was kind of that I don't really stay up at night thinking about, you know, Ivy league swim meets, you know, that like, that's, that's not, you know, that, 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 that's not much on my mind one way or the other. But he's like, you know, but like he really wanted to talk about it, so we talked yeah, about it. Obviously, he cares about it a lot because he's he's very into sports and, and MA, right? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Like, like I mean, I think he actually is like, you know, <laughs> like like genuinely like there are a lot of people who are sort of like They pretend they're uh, concerned, yeah. Yeah, they they sort of pretend they're concerned. I think he actually does spend a lot of his time thinking about stuff like that. But like but then uh but then so it's like, all right, we're gonna talk about it. So basically what I said, which, you know, I have to say still seems correct to me, is like, well, look, I mean my sort of um you know, my impulse is to, you know, what the rules to be set in some ways that would some way that wouldn't completely stop trans women from participating if 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 I think I said some board if I had like a trans daughter and there's like nothing that she could do to participate in sports, like I would yeah. find that upsetting, you know, but like 
Uh, but I also recognize that like what exactly would count as like reasonable hormone requirements or whatever. That's a, that's a really complicated question in which I don't really have, I don't, I don't really know anything. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like this is, uh, I'm, I'm hilariously far from being an expert in any of that stuff. You know, it's, it's not really what I spend my time thinking about. So like on the finer details, I don't know, but I think there must be some sort of reasonable solution here. And that's the that's the kind of answer that manages to piss off almost everybody because it's because uh, it it like people who are um, people who basically think that like trans women should be able to participate in women's sports correctly latched on to the fact that I don't agree with them and so like they don't, they didn't like it right but like yeah. uh, but then like you know but then there are all these other people who are like no you really should have fought him about that it's like I don't fucking know I mean how like like do you do you think I do you think that like I had some like incredibly well thought out response to that that I was just hiding right you know it's yeah, like, yeah, I, like I have, no. I, have, I have no idea right you know like uh, I I think some things are actually hard and you know and, and, and yeah, I, no, know. I think that's the, the that's an issue which is genuinely just really quite complicated and also brings into the whole question of like why do we have women's sports? Right. Yeah. Right. Like, especially in like something like chess, where it's like, you know, yeah, chess is no, a weird example, right? Like, like because it's, it's there's so... no physical difference. And basically, women's the women's game exists because less women play chess. Right. Right. And and so if there were, and so because you just have a lesser pool to to pick from, you have less geniuses or less incredibly uh, yeah. competent players yeah, yeah. or so on. And so that's why you have women's sports. But then obviously the justification in different sports is is different. Um, so I think, yes, I think people will either, because obviously I mean, there's just transphobes who would just reject the whole thing. But then there's sure, kind of, of leftists who will just say, like, just let people do whatever. But obviously that will just kind of lead to like a collapse of, of, of men and women's sports. Like it won't, the system won't function anymore. And obviously that's an opportunity for us to change things, to genuinely think right. about why do we have men and women's sports? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Because we have more than two genders now, and and, and so sure, on. Sure, right. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And I and I also think there is a small part of this. You know, I mean, obviously, this is not the whole issue. This isn't this isn't like a you know solution to the whole issue. But like, you know, there is a small part of this. I think is always worth saying when it comes up, which is something my friend Dave Hewitt, uh, you know, said when we was talking about him with this. That's like something people always bring up when they're talking about like. Uh, you know, secondary education, you know, women's sports, uh, is, well, um, it's important, you know, it's important to have, you know, like fair standards or whatever, because, you know, cause like, uh, college scholarships are, uh, are often on the line. With <laughs> yeah. That, and that sucks. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's like, yeah, but like, shouldn't the larger point here, instead of being like, like enough, like spending all of our time thinking about how to more fairly distribute those college scholarships, you know, like, like should the larger point be how obscene is it that, you know, that you need to like, you know, um, that, that like there are people who, you know, need to be good at sports, you know, to, uh, to, to be able to, to go yeah, to college. And, right? and, you and it's not even like you, you, sh- you should have to like, like if we just, if we just had tuition free higher education, then like that issue is off the table and like, at, at, at least in high school, I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I mean, I understand I've seen Friday Night Lights. I know some people are very concerned about bringing you know, high school sports and like it's a big emotional part of their lives, but like, you know, but, but it shouldn't be right. I mean, like, I sort of yeah. think like high school sports should just be like, I don't know. You're, you're like getting some exercise and like having like, you know, and like enjoying teamwork and, you know, and all yeah. that stuff. And like, at that point, you're just, you know, kicking a ball around and there's nothing financial. At stake I mean, I, I think of- there's kind of a special problem here with the United States because on one hand, you know, you talk about kind yeah. of, oh, you know, it's crazy that people get into college through sports scholarships, but that yeah. isn't even for the benefit of those people because yeah. the U.S. No, has a mon- monopoly, mon- monopoly, whatever, <laughs> uh, system with sports where you have to go through the college system before you can join professional leagues. Yeah. Like these, these kids are like getting free ride at college while British teenagers who are equally good at sports in, in like playing football and in, in other sports too, are just getting paid hundreds of thousands of pounds while these college kids in the U S are like playing at the top level and getting absolutely nothing. Right. And that's also with kind of high school sports, high school sports matter because it's a place where you can play football for free. While mm-hmm. in the UK youth footballers get a small stipend from their clubs in the U S you have to pay to attend a youth academy. So yeah, yeah. the U S sports yeah. scene is fucked. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's worth, and that's kind of the thing. The, the unfortunate thing is here, 
people will refuse to think about these issues seriously and instead yeah. focus on this very minor part of it when it's like this shit's fucked and it's like this shit fu- isn't fucked because of trans people just the whole thing is no, no, fucked no. up no exactly um yeah um you know also uh also, while we're at it, I, 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 I'm a big fan of, uh, of of municipal ownership of professional sports teams, and and, and they, you know, and so like I think athletes should be like moderately okay paid public employees, you know. But uh, that's uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll just kind of the, the fan owned model that they impose in general. Yeah, yeah, no, that works. Yeah, yep, yeah, or yeah, or like the Green Bay Packers, same same kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah, but to go back to kind of the left, and while we don't have a yeah. left Peterson. Yeah. Um, another thing that you've been doing, which I think leftists are very reluctant to do, and it's interesting because this is also something philosophers are reluctant to do, is debates. Mm-hmm. Recently, you even went on a, a debate stage with a guy who, I mean, I was thinking about this, I was going to describe him in a certain way, and I remember he's very litigious. <laughs> but he's the head of Project Veritas, which yeah. is an organization that's known for have lost many court cases. Um, but also to have been involved in many court cases. So specifically kind of um, will it, being willing to debate him is, is an interesting, an interesting yeah, yeah. view. Yeah, he's somebody who, right, of, you know, I, I, think, I think you can still stay well clear of, of litigation and, and, and say that, you know, he's somebody who, you know, many people might describe as, as a <laughs> gutter-dwelling lion scum fuck. So they have a, that yeah. guy, uh, James O'Keefe, uh, yeah, I mean, like, so, so to my mind, uh, you know, I mean, in some ways that does sort of stretch the, you know, stretch the outer limits uh, for uh, for me of, of who I'd uh, even not willing to uh, to do that with. But I think that, um, but you know, the the point to my mind of of doing stuff like that is, you know, it it's not like, well. You know, like you think about what the goal is of of doing that, right? And I think that there's some, and you know, there are certain kinds of debates that, like, look, if I'm just gonna like, you know, somebody's like, hey, you want to like come on my YouTube channel and talk about utilitarianism or something, like, the only goal is like, yeah, okay, that sounds like a fun thing to do this afternoon, and maybe we could like, you know, replay it later on my channel. No. Like, you know, it's it's not, uh, you know, it's not that deep, but like any, but like sort of bigger things um you know i i think that with political debates at least standardly i would see you know the goal as to persuade you know whoever is persuadable in the audience which yeah. is which which might sound like a really uninterestingly obvious thing to say but i i do find that a lot of people who have these sort of reservations about debate once you really start to talk about that, they, they don't actually assume that at all, right? I mean, they, they, yeah. they'll sort of say things like, well, why, how could you, you know, like if there's no point to debating somebody if they're not a, you know, good faith actor, right? That's maybe yeah, yeah. the Sartre's least useful legacy to the left that, you know, this, these phrases, good faith and bad faith, you know, that the, uh, uh, that... I had not made that connection. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's where they get them or not, okay. I'm just assuming, but they have a, yeah, that's, uh, uh, but yeah, like people have this, I think, kind of unhealthy, you know, fixation with, with that, right? This sort of level of sincerity of their enemies. And I sort of think it doesn't matter that much. It's, it's not a very interesting question uh, that, because uh, even if somebody's is somebody who we would all consider to be like a really good faith actor, uh, it's still generally not a realistic goal for a debate to convince them, right? I mean, yeah. that they, like, like, like nobody's, you know, like, like you could be, um, you know, you could be an incredibly sincere person, like, uh, and it's it's still just like psychologically so massively unlikely for so many reasons that you're just gonna, you know, like like three quarters of the way through, you know, like talking to to somebody. Oh, damn it! You're right. This I mean, thing ima- that- imagine if you became an atheist on stage. <laughs> yeah, that'd be right. That'd be amazing. Uh, yeah, right. It's not gonna happen, right? Nobody's gonna like. Uh, you know, again, you could be the the most sincere person in the world, and it's just incredibly psychologically unlikely that, like, like even ordinary people when they're just like arguing on Facebook or something aren't uh, usually when you're in the middle of arguing. 
Like, I mean, when right. when people come to ask philosophy, even though yeah. they're meant, presumably they're meant, there to ask a question to find things out and change yeah. their mind, are really often very resistant to doing so, even though they're kind of self-selected incredibly heavily towards doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that there's like it's incredibly rare that people change their mind in the room, right? That they um, like even when you're yeah just arguing about something on on Reddit or whatever. Uh, while the argument's going on, there's just way too much ego bound up in it for it to be realistic that you're going to like admit to yourself that you're wrong usually. Right. Um, and then, of course, it's even harder if you're somebody who has built up a you know personal professional identity that is largely based on your your politics, for example. That you know that you're it's even less likely, right? Like it's even more of a you know psychological yeah. bridge too far that you know you're you're gonna. I mean, people who are at that level do still sometimes change their minds, right? There are plenty of famous cases of that, but it's a, but like at that point, right? I mean, like, I mean, the person who's arguing on Reddit or whatever, when they're thinking back to it six weeks later, they might be like, yeah, that guy had a point. Okay. Yeah. You know, like, that, you know, but like, if you're like, um, you know, I mean, if you're like, I don't know, uh, Christopher Hitchens changing his, you know, like some of his political views or your, yeah. you know, whatever, some famous example of somebody who's, who's like a, some weirdo Catholic convert or whatever. Like they have a, like if you have like, yeah, people do do things like that. Right. But it's like a big deal. It's, yeah. it's and it's very unlikely that a single debate, you know, is, is going to, is going to be the thing that makes the, uh, the difference. So it's, you're not, you know, like what the sort of level of sincerity is. The other person is usually not very interested, right? The interesting question is, who are you trying to convince? Like, do you think that there's like a significant, you know, group of people? And this is often very hard to tell, right? It's kind of a, a gut level, you know, guess, right? You know, that they, who, um, who are, who are watching, who it would be like a good use of your time, right. To, uh, to try to, uh, to try to reach. So like in the, I, mean, um, I think it can be significant in the sense that even if you're not going to change the mind of some right wing inclined conservative person, you can at least convince them that leftists aren't like all demons essentially. Yeah, yeah. Like just kind of being like a reasonable, normal guy, you know? Yeah, which could in turn make them, um, you know, make them more open, you know, to uh, yeah. to, to left left wing ideas in the future. Absolutely, uh, yeah. And I, I I assume even with the audience, it's usually uh, you know it's a process, right? I mean, yeah. there there it's it's very aren't. Um, I mean, like everybody else who does this, I'll have people tell me like, oh, you know, I used to be a libertarian, whatever, you know, and like you know, and and, and they'll they'll you know, give me props for helping to, you know, to bring them around, which is very gratified, but like, it's not like, um, but I, I don't, I, I, I tend to think in most of those cases, if I really interrogated them about it, which I'm not going to do, I'm just going to say, you know, thanks, appreciate it, brother. Right. You know, but like yeah. I have a, uh, but if I really interrogated about the, about it, I imagine what they really mean is like, well, that might've like planted a seed that combined with like five other things. Right. You know, yeah. had, to, I help help bring them around, but I still think that like, it is important that who you're trying to talk to is persuadable people in the audience. And I think it's a really important point that um, every audience, right? People like another of these basic mistakes people make, like thinking that you're the goal is to try to persuade the other person on stage or the person on the other side of the split YouTube screen, uh, like a, a sort of really basic mistake on that level that people very often make, you know, that like is very obvious when people make these anti-debate, you know, arguments is, uh, that they assume that they equate the audience as a whole with like the most hardcore fans of yeah. the person you're you're arguing with, which again is one of those things that's like as soon as you sort of name it, like it, as a, that assumption, right? It, it it just becomes immediately clear that, that doesn't really make sense, right? Because it's like, well, no, I mean, any audience that's bigger than like twenty people, right, is is not going to be entirely entirely consistent of the most hardcore fans, right? They're they're going to be all kinds of people who are who are watching and you know there's gonna be yeah i mean exactly why these channels these right wing conservative channels are the popular ones is because they have a lot of casual views it's because youtube directs people when they when they finish watching their cringe compilations to then watch ben shapiro or whatever you know totally yeah and yeah and so people like even disregarded the hate watchers right i mean like there are there are going to be there's going to be a range going from people who are Sure, hardcore fans you probably can't reach to people who are, you know, pretty sympathetic to what the host is saying, but you know they're they're not like 
really iced in, right? You know, they're like willing to give them the sympathetic hearing. They're maybe started to dip a toe in. There are going to be people who maybe even were hardcore fans, but you know, I mean, just sort of like once the numbers get large enough, it's inevitable. There are lots of people in all these categories maybe were hardcore yeah. fans, but you happen to catch them at exactly the right point in their arc that they're open to something else, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah. So it's like, and I don't, you know, I mean, I think that there's also this weird thing that people do, um, you know, I where they say well look do you think you can i don't know know, debate your way to socialism or do you think you can like sort of um that just that just doing debates is going to have x y or z amazing political results it's like no not really like i don't i also don't think like i also don't think you can like podcast your way to socialism right like that's that's (laughs) yeah it's it's all kind of like yeah of course it's not going to do that much but then what does anything we do do that much like (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like, look, I think if you're going to do media things, I actually think this is one of the more useful things you could do with media. Like, because... like I, I, I became like a, a guerrilla and like fought in a revolutionary war, but I don't think me individually, I didn't really do anything, you know, like yeah, there's yeah. not, there's no, it's, there's it's, no, it's not, it's, there's no... I, I, I thought it was how Stefan defeated ISIS. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, it's, it's not, yeah, like you, like, I actually think it's one of the more useful things you can do with media if, because if nothing else, we live in such an incredibly fragmentedly media landscape that debates are practically the only chance you ever get to speak to anybody else's audience, right? I think that's yeah. incredibly useful relative to media, right? Now, do I think yeah. there's anything you can do with media that's going to be the sort of like main part of a successful political strategy? No, not really. Like, I think that yeah. there's a reason why. Like, if you look at, like, successful, you know, revolutions or, you know, successful reform movements, even, you know, throughout history, uh, you know, that there are exact examples that were, where, like, all of the participants were journalists, right? I mean, like, that's, uh, that's not... It involves like, a lot of going outside. Yeah, yeah exactly, right? You, you, have to, you have to actually log off at some point and talk to people. Yeah, and I think one thing which there's, like, a real tension between... Where yeah. you'll see people saying that, like, you know, no one's ever changed their mind with an internet argument. And then the same person will, like, then post, like, a, a political compass where it shows them, like, over, like, an 18 months period having every position on that compass. And it's like, if you've got completely different politics six months later, how did that happen? And how, how can that be true with the other thing that you've said, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of standard dub joke that's only half a joke I always, I always tell when the subject comes up is that like half, you know, like it always drives me crazy if I actually know the person who says like nobody ever changes their mind because of arguments. Cause it's like, well, dude, like I know you, you were, you know, you grew up in a right wing evangelical household. You became an atheist when you were watching (laughs) Richard Dawkins videos when you were 16. Uh, You were just a standard MSNBC liberal from that until the 2016 election. And then you, joined dsa and now you're like halfway to maoism and you're going to tell me that nobody <laughs> changes their minds you know because of arguments like did all those things were all those things just sort of spontaneous events in your brain like that nothing to do yeah, with yeah. It's like, it's like ha- it's sam harris you. says they were just spontaneous events <laughs> um, do you want to know why i stopped being a teenage libertarian why i heard that quote someone posted that quote at me of the guy who's like the law and it's all, all it's majestic equality forbid yeah, yeah. both the rich man and the poor man from sleeping on the bridges and i was like fuck it does <laughs> this doesn't really work you know 